big survey. Right? Oh, they okay. just inquired as to whether we expect that. Do they know. want to say anything? No. Okay. Uh, and then they inquired whether they would be, they could or whether we wanted them to respond. And I said only through the council chair. Different questions. To respond to any questions that may come out of it. Right. So you um, control the flow of information. Uh, unless there's something burning. Uh, so don't get into it if you don't take but if it's an obvious answer, or if one that can be provided. So my brother has um, a boy and a girl who are five months apart. They were adopted from Russia. And uh, yeah, it was them. So I was telling Tony, my nephew, 43 college credits already. Wow. He's, and he's pre-med. He got accepted. Um, Where's he going? Uh, Michigan State. And uh, but he almost didn't graduate because he didn't turn in a three-page uh, English paper. <laughs> <laughs> like Dallas, what are you doing, fool? Yeah, she must sure. have out too, right? Because she did. She came for the weekend. I think he's right around 50. Fluid. We were waiting for think. I'm not sure. Yeah, she was supposed to send something, she said, and it was 1 o'clock in the morning. I got an email from her, literally, at 1 in the morning, saying, yeah, I was supposed to prepare something for the council, but I didn't. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'll be surprised. It's, yeah, it's the recommendation for the uh, use of land bonds for the oh, okay. uh, land trust purchase. Yep.
All right. Good evening, and uh, thank you. Welcome to the regular town council meeting. It is June 5th, 2019. Uh, we do have quite an audience here. It's uh, nice to see so many friendly faces, so thank you for coming out this evening. Um, just uh, by quick way of, um, uh, I don't usually sit in the seat. So Councillor Hayes is at the baccalaureate graduation ceremony for his son. Um, so he, I'm filling in this evening, so bear with me as I fumble through Robert's rules tonight. And uh, Councillor Baybine also uh, let us know this afternoon due to his legislative duties up at the State House will not be here. So we're a small but mighty crew and we'll still get through the agenda just fine. Um, so if you'll please join us for in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Item three is roll call. Councilor Johnson? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Donovan? Here. Council Hamill? Here. And Vice Chair Foley? Here. All right, and item four is general public comments. This is a time for anyone who wishes to speak on any topic um, that is not on the agenda. Uh, please come up to the podium and State your name and address, uh, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. My name is Mike Little. I live in Boston, New Hampshire, but I have lived in two towns in Maine my, almost my entire life, Cape Elizabeth and Falmouth. But my uh, relationship with Scarborough goes back almost 50 years. I was in uh, Bruce Thurlow's house on 6 Jasper Street almost 50 years ago, back then I think the fire chief was either before he was born or when he was a diapers. So I've got a long term connection to this town and a number of areas. And the reason I'm here tonight is that I'm going to comment on the recent promotion of uh, uh, Sergeant O'Malley, I guess it was Sergeant O'Malley, to, to a deputy chief following the uh, wonderful moral leadership of uh, Chief Mullen. I'm going to be doing an update on my previous article about uh, Sergeant O'Malley that appeared a few months ago. And the update will uh, cover his uh, strong belief in pro-choice find out uh, some of the items about uh, his conduct leading up to his uh, belief in pro-choice. So I'll be coming up uh, relatively soon on my website, fellowtoday.me. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public wishing to speak on a topic not on the agenda this evening? Okay. I don't think some of the microphones are working. Can you mine, for example? Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. It, the green light's on, so it says. Okay. <laughs> lean, lean in. I'll lean in. I think the. I'll use my teacher the voice. Podiums are not working right. Okay, the podium microphone. Sure. Okay, so the podium microphone may not be working right, but I think there's don't a hand. Me, don't worry. There's a hand. Up. <laughs> <laughs> David's got a great teacher voice. <laughs> I do have that command voice. Dave Green, 135 Beach Ridge Road. There's all kinds of things I'd like to address go to one thing that I've had in the back of my mind about how this council operates for well into a year and a half now. back of my mind for about a year and a half now it goes back to the school board recall and avenue two and all kinds of issues in this town that this council has divided this town okay i'm old scarborough and i'm sick of seeing what's going on down here this is becoming a cesspool it truly is and some of you people need to really step up to the plate and start acting like town councilors okay and I got another issue. I will ask this council to please start looking into replacing our town manager. I believe it's long past time 
to do so, at least look into it. Please. It's coming. And I thank you. Second. members of the public that would like to speak on. I know we have a couple of folks that uh, actually have a presentation that we, we told them they could start. If you'd let those two go first and then come in behind them, that would be great. Just because they're using some technology. Okay. And just for the public's benefit, like normally, <laughs> yes. normally you would get uh, <laughs> just a three minute time period because there are a couple of speakers combining their commentary. Uh, we're allowing uh, an extended period of time for that. So they'll have six minutes between the two of them. So my turn. Good evening. My name is Donald Semino. As you may know, my wife and I live at Fort Newcomb Ridge. We have been there for well over 40 years, totally expecting this area to stay as it, as it is zoned, RF2. As you can guess, we were very much opposed to the original Piper Shores contract zone but found there was little we could do about it. Big money wins. Now here they come again with a proposed proposal uh, to build on Nevada Drive. As stated when they got their original contract on, they said it was all of they wanted. Well, where we are today, a proposal that far exceeds current density. For this, they need another contract zone, not just a contract zone, but an amendment to their existing contract zone. This way, they can avoid notification to a butter, it seems. Seems odd to me this could even be possible, as the Dorado parcel isn't even in the current existing contract zone. And it isn't even known by Piper Shores yet. Mind you, we are not opposed to this parcel being developed as zone. We are very much opposed to the Dorado project as proposed, especially the huge hotel type building in the middle of it. Town officials suggested Piper Shores reach out to about us, but little has taken place. I have an example of reaching out. This letter, right here, this little paragraph and a half, they're inviting us to a June 13th uh, meeting, neighborhood meeting, with, a, with the vote being taken on the 19th. That, that doesn't give much of a chance for us to, to accomplish a whole lot. Now this letter dated May 29th, which is, and then knowing the town council is scheduled to vote on the proposal less a week after, how productive do you think this will be? Some reaching out. <laughs> if, if we were made aware of this project from the very beginning, we would have not, we would not be here tonight. Thank you very much for listening. Tim Yeomans at 10 Newcomb Ridge Road. I'm here tonight on behalf of also Lori Yeomans at 10 Newcomb Ridge Road. And I've also been asked to talk by Bob Yensha of Stone Ridge Road and Karen Yensha of Stone Ridge Road. They've yielded all their time to me, but don't worry, I won't use all that time. Um, three messages I'd like to leave the council with tonight. One, rural farming district. Two, 347%, and that is the amount uh, by which Piper Shore's uh, proposal exceeds the existing and permitted density. 52 units divided by 15 units, which is the existing and permitted according to Piper Shore's own analysis. That's 347%. And the third message is be a champion. So where we are now is that when the council votes, they have to make before the vote, according to the procedure section, 
Section 4C2 of the Contract Zoning Ordinance, the council has to make before the vote four findings on four different matters, and all have to be, four of them be, be approved by the council before the vote actually happens. That's the order in the ordinance. I'm only going to talk about two things that, again, of, the, of all four that need to be approved, and uh, these two we feel Piper Shores fails on. They only have to fail on one to, for the council to vote it down. We fail, feel they fail on these two. The first one I'm going to talk about is consistency with the comprehensive plan. On page three of your agenda tonight, uh, it says that this agenda item is sponsored by the planning department. And not the planning board, the planning department. And the recommendation is ought to approve. I call your attention also to page 12 of the comprehensive plan that calls in big gold letters on all Scarborough citizens to, quote, be a champion of the comprehensive plan. It appears that the planning director, head of the planning department, has chosen to oppose being a champion of the comprehensive plan. This is mind-boggling because the comprehensive plan should be under the planning director, but the planning director is recommending that this Piper Shores project ought to be approved by the council. The planning, the Piper Shores proposal is completely against the core of the comprehensive plan, which is the growth sectors. The growth sectors, the growth framework, in this case the limited growth sector, is the absolute core. Yes, you could say, and I guess the planning director is saying, that it's the Piper Shores proposal is compatible with peripheral issues, but it's not compatible with the core. How can you be a champion of the comprehensive plan if you don't agree with the core of the comprehensive plan? What the planning department is doing and saying to all developers that might develop in Scarborough is that the Scarborough planning department and Scarborough planning director is not a champion of the comprehensive plan and is, does not believe in the core of the comprehensive plan because this proposal is 347% of the required density. I'd like to also address now getting on to consistency with the existing and uh, permitted uses of the existing zoning, zoning classification. This is the existing land on Dorado Drive. Piper Shores in their recent submittal uh, claims that it, uh, it's compatible because it's a continuing care community. The continuing care community is in a different district. It's down the street. By that logic, Piper Shores could just claim that they're compatible with the Acura dealership on Haggis Parkway. It's an absurd justification. They also, Piper Shores is also saying that they're compatible with the rural farming district because they're building nursing homes and boarding care facilities. Yet section 10 of their recent submittal says they're not building nursing homes and boarding care facilities on this uh, parcel. Also, nursing homes require a density lowering of one dwelling unit per five acres. It's the wrong direction from what they're proposing. Also, in the zoning ordinance, boarding care facilities cannot have any kitchens. Every one of their units has a kitchen. So this is just a false statement that Piper Shores is making to, to try to justify compatibility with the uh, rural farming zone. In the huge apartment building, Piper Shores makes the same false statements that they're compatible by having nursing homes, boarding facilities in this uh, proposed parcel. But also they claim that it's compatible because they're building a place of worship. Nowhere have they said they're building a place of worship. They also complain, uh, say that it's compatible because they're making a municipal building. This is news to all of us. They're not building a municipal building. Lastly, they say it's compatible because of residential cluster. The residential cluster portion of the Rural Farming Zoning Ordinance says you have to keep the same density, 15 units in 45 acres. Okay, they can be clusters, not 52 units in 45 acres. The bottom line here is that this project is dangerous for Scarborough. All future developers will look to this project's proposed 347% of existing and permitted rural farm zone density and as a precedent. And developers will likely seek the same 347% of existing and permitted permitted uh, density on, let's say, places like Harmon Island. What about Higgins Beach? Should we allow triple density on Pleasant Hill, Blue Point, Prout's Neck, or North Scarborough? We ask the town council to be a champion 
to follow the comprehensive plan, as all of us have been asked by the comprehensive plan, and reject this 347% excessive development. Thank you. Thank you. So he wasn't the sixth man. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bob Dulac. I live at 6 Newcomb Ridge. Actually, he is Lucas Newcomb. He lives at 8 Newcomb Ridge, and he's here to assist in the small little slideshow we've, uh, we've uh, <coughs> provided today. Thirteen years ago, my wife and I moved to Newcomb Ridge to escape the fishbowl that we lived in for years. The neighborhood consisted of small lots, 50-foot divisions between each house. Everyone knew everyone's business, and everyone um, knew everyone's gossip. I woke up every morning to my neighbor's alarm clock rather than my own. The lifestyle had grown old and it was time to move. My new Newcomb Ridge residents, uh, neighbors, arrived escaping, arrived escaping the roll fish bowl as well. For us, this section of Scarborough checked off all the boxes. Areas of limited development, open space and privacy is value, protect, protected land and wildlife, access to beaches and protection from overdevelopment through our current RF zone requirement. The Route 77 corridors you see on the, on the uh, screen is possibly the most beautiful sector the town has to offer. We have ocean views, ocean access, we have marshland, we have inlets, we have rivers, we have open space. If you look at the Dorado Drive, which you probably can't see from there, uh, it's somewhere in the middle of the light green, and the light green is the RS zone, the rural farming or the rural residential. Uh, around that light green is the dark green, which is the resource protection uh, where no development is allowed whatsoever. I guess our point is, you look at if you look at where Dorado Drive is, everything around it is either a light green or a dark green. The, the map clearly shows that the limited growth is in that limited growth is is what our area is all about. We believe this is what Scarborough wants, and this is made clear with the comprehensive plan of the limited growth sector. And I know we've been redundant, but I'm gonna read it one more time as you look at it. Scarborough has rural zoning districts with two acre minimum lot size requirements, hoping to conserve the natural qualities of the rural open space. The purpose of these districts is to lower the overall population density, to protect the environmentally sensitive areas, as well as maintain larger tracts of land for resource uses, but allow some development and flexibility. The town's desire to see development, but with subject development under current zoning, such as the RF zoning on Dorado Drive. We, we, we believe we got there with the lack of notification allowed to us with no voice uh, at the first reading of the Town Council on June 20th, 2018. Um, that had to do with amended contract zone versus new contract zone. An amended contract zone didn't require any notification to the abutters, and I think in the clip we're about to show, not having any butter input led us down to this road. Uh, Lucas, I don't know if you have a, if you can play that clip. Let me play. Uh, I attended the uh, public hearing for the neighborhood, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the meeting went well. Uh, uh, most of the people from the neighborhood were from the acorns on the lawn street uh, area, and uh, several so people I know. Most of the people from the neighborhood were from the Acorn Street uh, area, and uh, some of whom I know, and uh, uh, so I was encouraged that uh, the two uh, subdivisions that run uh, astride this proposed development seem to be on board uh, with it. And I think that's very important because we are uh, uh, placing uh, a higher density than the current zoning allows. Uh, seeing no further discussion, uh, all in favor? Opposed? Thank you. And thank you for the presentation and, and answering all our questions. Planning board. Uh, I want to repeat, uh, 
Chairman Donovan, and I'm going to repeat exactly what he said, the two subdivisions that run astride this proposed development seem to be on board with it. I think that's very important because we are placing a higher density than the current zoning allows. If our being on board with it on June 20, 2018 was important then, why is it important now, June 5, 2019, one year later? Uh, we agree with Councilor Donovan that density is much higher. We agree with Councilor Donovan that abutters need to be on board. The so-called public meeting he was referring to was a private Piper Shores event that Newcomb Ridge residents were not invited to. The abutter opposition is clear to this day. We believe, and I have had discussions with some councils, had the councils been aware of the uh, universal opposition that this proposal would have caused at that point at that meeting. Our concern now is because of Piper Shores' apparent significant money spent to the Piper Shore, uh, by Piper Shores, the town is doing all it can to justify the approval of this proposal, which is wrong. Looking at all non-Piper Shore contract zones, it is clear that all non-Piper Shore contract zones have been and are consistent with the comprehensive limited growth sector, have been and are compatible with the pre-existing and permitted uses, and require small tweaks and changes. The Acura dealership, which was referred to this evening, is what a contract zone should look like. Piper Shores, in our view, appears to be getting a free pass as the largest taxpayer of Scarborough. We see no reason why Piper Shores should be allowed to bypass the RF zoning ordinance and or the comprehensive plan. Piper Shores simply does not belong on Grado <coughs> Drive. It is, in fact, a square peg not fit in, not fit in a round hole. That won't fit in a round hole. The reasons are numerous, and I'll state a few. Piper Shores is 347% over the allowed density, 52 to versus 14 or 15 units. Piper Shores is not compatible with the Dorado Drive existing zoning clarification. Piper Shores is inconsistent with the comprehensive plan and the limited growth sector. Piper Shores is not designed for Scarborough residents. Piper Shores provides no on-site affordable housing. Piper Shores allows low-paying jobs and high turnover. Piper Shores threatens our water table. I, I, I am going to ask you to watch the time, okay? Because I, I think there was some confusion around how many six-minute segments you might get. Are you almost done? I'm yeah. just, I'm just about there. I'm sorry, Great, Katie. thank you. That's okay, thank you. Uh, Piper Shores provides no skilled nursing. Piper Shores provides no elderly boarding care facilities, and Piper Shores ignores an abundance of other compatible and available land available in Scarborough as we speak. Please, our voices do matter. We are important. We are not on board. Please deny this project. And thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Sorry, she was had lined up ahead, and then is that okay? We can all share. Right? Thank you. I'm Betty Perry. I live at 24 Drake Lane in Piper Shores. And good evening. My husband Duncan, who is teaching tonight, and I believe that failing to approve the Piper Shores contract zone amendment application is a lose-lose scenario. Here's why. Piper Shores has proven to be an important part of the Scarborough community over the last 18 years. We're the largest taxpayer in Scarborough and pay approximately 1.5 million yearly in property taxes. We shop, eat, receive medical and dental care, buy gas, and bring significant business to the Scarborough community. Moreover, we use few public services and have no children in the school system, and so are not on a drain not a drain on the community in these areas. Piper Shores residents are very civic-minded professional people, neglect, ne neglecting to take account of or value the intellectual and professional resources that residents and staff bring is very short-sighted. Should the expansion occur, much more such involvement can be expected as both staff and resident numbers increase. In January, Duncan and I conducted a survey of the 260 Piper Shores independent living residents and found that 124 respondents 
have been or are currently volunteers with over 71 different local and state organizations. Nearly 20% of that number have served as officers. On top of all the thousands of hours of time and talent that we have happily given, we have also provided financial and in-kind donations to more than 106 different local and regional operations. The public benefit that Piper Shores offers thus seems clear. Allowing us to construct the meadows will, one, boost local business income, two, require minimal public services. Three, add more citizens dedicated to community volunteerism and charitable support. Four, provide new recreational trails for public use. Five, conserve approximately 12 and a half acres of land for posterity. And six, significantly increase the town's annual tax basis. And the good news continues. Our residents go to bed early, are not noisy, do not litter or clutter property. We maintain their surroundings well. They, we are considerate of and welcoming to neighbors who use the grounds. I urge you to support this opportunity to enhance growth and be assured with rock solid certainty that Piper Shores is and will continue to be a highly conscientious and constructively involved member of Scarborough. Please join us as a partner in responsible community development. We love being here and we totally support Scarborough and want to continue to be a strong supporter. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Sheila Hillman. I live in Three Wild Lane. If I were wise, I would just take my seat now and say what she said. <laughs> actually, I want to speak to you tonight as an abutter to the original project at Three Wildwood Lane. At that point, my husband and I also owned one Wildwood Lane, which was a direct abutter. And when the uh, project was announced, I, I wondered and fretted about the impact it would have on my neighborhood, and more specifically on my own home, which is close to Route 1. <coughs> I worried about increased traffic. I worried about uh, decreased water pressure in my own home. I worried about noise. I worried about where the retention ponds would be. I even worried about how many lumens would be released into the night sky. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say to you tonight that none of those fears was realized. These people have been good neighbors, as of course aptly mentioned by the previous person, and I wanted to address my other neighbors who were here tonight and so worried about having this really nice community in their neighborhood. Piper Shores has been kind of a no see -um. You can't see it from the road, but you can feel that they're contributing a great deal financially to the town. You can know that they are also serving on many boards, and I'm sure the same will be true of the proposed community largely not seen by the naked eye. So I, I'm here in support of that community. I would just like, like also to add that there are Scarborough <coughs> residents waiting to have a place in Piper Shores. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lucia Jones. I live at 14 Acorn Lane. I'm the butter. And I've been to several of these meetings, and I appreciate everyone to come together, but I do have to say that here we are a year later, and um, it's been a challenging situation just as um, giving the perspective of those of us that are abutters, just to keep up with what is going on with this project is very challenging. As a full-time person working, you know, having a family, other uh, neighbors on Acorn Lane, there's 18 houses there, all of us trying to keep up via email about what is the process here. This has been very challenging to keep up with. It's a huge project. And we all, as you know, you have the decision in your hands to make a decision of whether or not this project will go forward. Um, for us, we bought into this neighborhood with a promise that's an RF zone that we would have this privacy. And all of the reasons that have been listed about the pluses of having Piper Shore Project go forward are great. 
But you know what? Having houses back there would be great too. Those families that would purchase those homes would be just as good of uh, an environment, volunteering in the community, contributing to Scarborough, all of those things. So just to dismiss the fact that the way it is would be a negative is ridiculous. These people, especially Newcomb Ridge residents, are going to be facing the four-story apartment building. People would not be objecting so much to townhouses or independent living. That would not be, you know, we would not be here a year later. The sticking point is the four-story commons that we have had to think about. This is a huge, it's tripling the size, if not 10 times the size of what exists there. That 7,500 square foot house that the McDonald's have will come down and they'll put up a huge building that we'll have to look at forever, forever changing why we bought into the neighborhood. And the things that concern me as an individual of butter is the fact that this can happen again. You know, if this project goes through, there's still two other parcels of land that are next to that. If those owners want to sell to Piper Shores, they could possibly expand again, ask for another amendment, and continue to build. You know, again, disrupting what we bought into 20, 30 years ago as this project. So you hold the responsibility of thinking through all of these things. Um, and so I, I just want to really, uh, I guess, just articulate that it has been just so challenging just to keep up with what is the process because the average person doesn't understand the changes of RF zone after they've purchased a property uh, property like this. And I would say that it's been, um, there were very little changes that were done until uh, February with Piper Shores. We met several times with them, emails, community me meetings, but it may have been maybe more useful for the town to just meet with the abutters. But that could have been an option, but you know, if you were just having these individual meetings. So it just seemed very time consuming. I also just want to read um, a letter uh, that my husband wrote. He was not able to, to be here, but I'm hoping that you receive this letter. <coughs> so I, I, yes? I'm sorry, we're actually going to read it oh, okay. um, for him, so because your time is out. OK. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank she you. Can time. Do you want, yeah, we'll, she can read it. She can read it. Yeah. OK, you want to give her another? Absolutely. It's better than me. <laughs> you probably know your husband's infliction. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so you um, can give us okay the thank you very much. I have a um, physical copy. Okay, thank you. I'm sure you do, but I'm just reading it for the benefit of the public. No, I know. Do you want to read it? Is so it easier than reading okay, it off the phone? Thank you so much for <laughs> Yes, he is. Okay. Um, yes, my husband is Jeff Jones, yes. uh, 14 Acorn Lane, and he was not able to be here. But as um, and a butter to this project, uh, we've had two main objections to the project. The first is the size of the location of the commons. The second is the lack of the pedestrian travel and the increased traffic to this project and the current proposed amendment that have had on Spurman Road and the fact is not being addressed as by the applicant. <clears throat> Regarding the large 94,000 square foot building named the commons, we believe it is too large and too tall of a structure. The height limit in Scarborough is 35 feet. The proposal calls for 40 feet in height. This allows basically four-story building to shadow over the residents of Newcomb, which will easily be seen from House on Acorn Lane. As you know, the, through the site walk, when we were standing at the location of the proposed apartment building, I pointed out my yellow house that could be entirely seen from our vantage point, the 40-foot building. It may be years before this is enough growth for new trees to adequately buffer Acorn Lane residents from light, noise, sight, and the large building. This is especially true given the construction of the estate, which will require removal of much of the existing tree coverage to construct these homes. If those trees were replaced with 12-foot 12, 12 uh, high trees, it, in the event the apartment building will be visible for many of our street's residents, we believe that the height should be reduced, perhaps underground parking or placement of the building in front of the highest point of the land so the building fits into the topography much better. We've always believed in the pocket neighborhood. The estates are compatible with the RF zone, and we have no objection to what, uh, whatsoever to those houses. In the RF zone, this is the type of development that everyone expected. The commons, on the other hand, is not compatible with the existing and permitted uses of the RF zone. There is also a serious question if the commons is consistent with the comprehensive plan. I would not call a four-story 94,000 square foot consistent with the, um, any location in the limited growth sector. The major issue that we have with the lack of improvements to Spurman Road Route 77 is in light of the Piper Shores development. Since the Piper Shores contract zone of 1990, there have been no widening of the road, no sidewalks, no bike lanes. This area has a high use of recreation area in the town with hundreds of bicycles, people bicycling every day, pedestrians, hundreds of summer residents, 
walking to and from Higgins Beach. In 1998, it was estimated that between 100 to 200 cars per hour during peak hours, morning and night. There have been no studies done to see what guesstimates are accurate. The memorandums and the letters relied upon by the DEP and the MDOT in 1998 are not in any file and not in any town's file, nor the MDOT files, not even in the MDP files. However, if the best guess of 200 uh, cars equivalents an hour in 19th, the fact that the project was, has generated, this does not take into account the 10 amendments to the site plan subdivision that have taken place since 1998. The major changes are as follows. In 2002, 45 additional parking spaces were added to increase pavement truck driveway. In 2010, increased parking again with additional 34 spots. The healthcare facility, the pool, the fitness center, the construction school auditorium. In 2013, again, more parking was added, 11 <coughs> spots. In 2015, construction of a three-story building, 22, uh, 22,300 square foot building, adding an arts building, and a significant expansion to the parking lot. As you can see from the above summary, that these are just a few of the amendments to the project since 1998, and there's been a significant amount of buildings and parking added to the project. This means more cars and trips. No one at the town or the state has had any idea of the impact of these amendments on traffic. No studies were ever done. No updates or figures or data. Nothing. And now the town once again is contemplating allowing an applicant, Piper Shores, to amend its 1998 proposed amendment. With absolutely no traffic studies provided to outline the true impact of the uh, increased traffic from this project. By the proposed amendment before the council now, the applicant indicates only a grand total of 130 trips per day, 65 entering and 65 leaving. Any common sense would tell a person that there are at least 52 residents on a street this number would be woefully low. Add to this number the daily sh shuttle between the campuses, the maintenance crews going between the camp camp campuses and 20 employees, delivery trucks, restaurants, the commons, the vendors. It is evident that this estimate doesn't pass the straight face test. The comprehensive plan for connectivity of neighborhoods and villages. The proposal falls short on this. The residents will be isolated from surrounding neighborhoods at Higgins Beach. The MDOT will not allow a crosswalk from this project across 77. Even if it were allowed, no one is going to use it. He or she cares about their safety because it's going too fast. The only safe travel is for sidewalks along 77 down to Ocean. This will connect this project to the beach community and allow safe travel for cars and pedestrians. For a $45 million project, which is asking for a complete zone change from the town, I am not sure of the hesitation by the town by requiring the applicant to improve safety and roads as they are directly in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Art Dillon. I live on Black Point Road. Um, I'm here representing the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce as I'm the current president. Um, these comments also echo my own personal feelings. As a community of business owners and operators, the Scarborough Chamber of Commerce sees enormous financial and social value in the Piper Shores proposed expansion at Dorado Drive. Piper Shores has already demonstrated it's not only a good neighbor, but it's a generous, thoughtful, reliable, and responsible neighbor in its 18-year operation. While most nonprofits are exempt from property taxes, Piper Shores has agreed from day one to pay its taxes for its independent living residents, uh, contributing close to $1.5 million annually. The enormous benefits of working and living in Scarborough have not been lost on its residents, as have been mentioned earlier. They have contributed a wealth of time, talent, uh, to worthy causes across our town including the Scarborough Land Trust, the Public Library, the Public Safety and Fire Department, the schools, Project Race, Camp Cancha, Operation Hope, and many other fine organizations. With this new project, we can ex expect another 85 residents becoming active Scarborough citizens, volunteering, donating, working, buying goods and services in our community. We also believe these res uh, residents will be thoughtful neighbors. Piper Shores is a known entity.
with the highest reputations, not just here in Scarborough, but the state and the region, in quality, quantity, and being a great community member. They've also agreed to preserve land, provide public parking, to access trails, contribute to the town's affordable housing program, uh, contribute funds for sidewalk installations, uh, add buffers, berms, mature trees. Being the oldest state in our country, there is a huge need for senior life care communities in our state. There's room for this addition, which also adds value to our town. As a member of the business community, we do not and must not underestimate the value these, their presence brings to our town. It's for this reason stated that we enthusiastically support and strongly recommend the expansion on Dorado Drive. Um, again, that also echoes my personal feelings. I also have, I don't know if you received a letter from the Portland Regional mm -hmm. Chamber. Okay. I just want to say that's been submitted from the Portland Regional Chamber. Uh, the CEO, Quincy Hensel, and the board chair, Al Swallow, have uh, submitted a letter in favor echoing those feelings. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Barbara Everson. I'm at 16 Drake Lane. And uh, many of my comments have already been said, so I won't repeat them, and I'll be, be very brief. Um, but I think one of the most important things that we need to realize here is that Piper Shores is not just for the elite. 25% of the units that are there are subsidized. The revenue, is, the revenue that people pay per month is less than what it costs to operate the, the property for their benefit. So they're, in a sense, subsidized by the larger units. So it allows people of more moderate income to be there. I think that's something that gets lost. Um, and I think that, from my perspective, in listening to the numerous benefits that we've been, had listed here tonight, I just think it would be very hard for a town council person to vote against the project. It has so much value for the community, for Scarborough as a whole. Not only just the tax benefit, but all the other wonderful things that have been enumerated that we offer. So um, I hope that you'll really consider approving the project. Thank you. Yeah, let's drive My name is Anne Thunderberg. I live in apartment J210 at Scarborough Drive in independent living. I don't know. Anyway, um, I'm concerned about some remarks I've heard uh, retailed about reactions to this project. One of them was to the effect that it would bring in a really lower class group of people as workers. And I was really shocked to hear that because I have never run into anybody on staff who is inconsiderate, uh, ill-mannered, uh, unsympathetic, I've talked with groundskeepers, I've talked with nurses, I've talked with the handyman, I've talked with everybody. And I find that they all understand, those of us who are getting older and sometimes have memory problems uh, or lose our balances, which is why I have this, uh, and they put up with us cheerfully, courteously, in a warm and understanding way. And I cannot imagine that the expansion, if it goes through, would hire anything less than that. That is what people want when they come to the end of their lives. They don't want to be in an area where people are unkind or rude. They want to be in a warm, accepting, comfortable area. And that is what I have found here. Um, I have never lived in co uh, this kind of housing in my life. I've always lived in a house. And I was really worried about what it was going to be like in Piper Shores. And I am absolutely amazed. I would never have believed that I would feel as comfortable, as accepted, and as part of the community. <coughs> it's very difficult at the age of 80 to suddenly encounter a whole new community of people who you've never met before, mm. much less try to remember their names. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if I don't remember the names of whoever cleans my house or my room for me, 
or if I don't remember who the nurses are, or that kind of thing, they all know me. Uh, peculiar voice, very tall. And, uh, <laughs> and as a result, I feel completely accepted, and I cannot believe that there would be anything different at, if Dorado Drive were to be developed. I hope that you will support it. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Joe Delafield. I live at 21 Drake Lane in Piper Shores, and I'm a registered voter in Scarborough. I came with a prepared list of all the benefits to the town uh, from the proposal. Um, I will skip that because you've already heard most of those, and I hope you will take them into account. I want to comment on a couple of things that have been said. You heard recently um, a lot about parking and traffic. It's my understanding that all of the technical aspects of this proposal have been thoroughly investigated by the Planning Board, and the Planning Board has approved it. Um, I also heard the abutters uh, talking about how, value, uh, how much value they place on the resource protection, uh, existing resource protection district. I hope you understand that that is Piper Shores property, that that was part of the original contract zone, and the resource protection was agreed to by Piper Shores at the time. And the current proposal includes adding additional land to resource protection uh, so that um, the, the, there will be, in fact, an increase in the resource protection. Um, I heard some of the abutters talking about how they felt they had not had adequate notice or adequate chance for input to this. I hope you will, I think as the information has been given to you, of the many, many meetings that have been held with abutters to which abutters were invited, that the abutters have been listened to, that many concessions have been made to the preparatures uh, plan to accommodate the interests of the abutters, and uh, so I, I hope you will take that into account. In, in my judgment, uh, as far as the town council's current question, do we approve this contract zone or not? On the one hand, you have the promise of very substantial tax revenues from the proposal estimated to be in the nature of half a million dollars per year with virtually no demand on the town uh, services. On the other hand, if it's not approved but the property is developed, as was suggested earlier, you would have uh, single-family homes, I presume, there, uh, probably with children who have to be educated at a cost to the town of $15,000 a year or more per student. We at Piper Shores don't produce children anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so that, that demand will simply not be there. So um, I think it's a very clear and easy decision for you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Bob Young. I live at 2 Newcomb Ridge. Uh, like my neighbors, I'm pretty dismayed by this whole project. And, and one of the things that's kind of getting lost in all this glowing stuff about Piper Shores is the due process issue. That video we saw of Mr. Donovan just shooing things through, that's what we're feeling right now. So please take that into account. I hope that you guys will give us due process and do this the right way. Uh, you see a little history where it doesn't look like that might be the case. So please. That looks like the end of public comment. So we'll move on to our next order of business. Uh, which is, I need my cheaters. Order number 19031, uh, a 7 p.m. public hearing, second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405 Zoning Ordinance, Section 
stop H. Oh, okay, the second reading for just for those of you who are, are we're here for the Piper Shores uh, project, the second reading will be on June 19th. 19th. I, I'm going to give it just a minute for them to settle on out. All right, so we'll move on. Um, if Jay Chase, if you'd like to provide any background or context for the next three items, you can stand close to the podium. I, I think we've beaten it up pretty well, but um, you can just get for the benefit of the audience, just give a quick Very summary. Sure. Quick intro? Okay, yep. great. Uh, let's see, so this first one is on the amendments to uh, the sign provisions of the zoning orders for campus directional signage. So. Um, so this is actually a proposal that's coming through a recommendation from our Long Range Planning Committee. Um, and as we talked about it uh, first reading, um, the stated purpose for campus directional signs is to provide uh, assistance to the public in finding specific businesses or locations um, within a unified development or a large multi-building uh, uh, or lot development. Um, and so many of our, or all of our larger commercial zones that have this sort of ability for multi multiple buildings, multiple lots, um, are able to um, put together a campus directional signage package and, and be reviewed by the planning board. Um, it was noticed in a recent review that um, that type of campus directional signage isn't allowed in the Crossroads Plan Development District, commonly referred to as the Downs Development. Um, the Crossroads Plan Development District really calls for a coordinated uh, development throughout the whole project, and campus directional signage plays a key component in that. So uh, the proposal is simply to add um, uh, an allowance within the uh, building ordinance to allow campus directional sign signs to be utilized within the Crossroads Plan Development District. Great. Thank you. So is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. And discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. And that leads us to order number 19-032, uh, public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to chapter 405B, the site plan review ordinance uh, section 3B, site plan application procedures and action. Uh, and this actually came from the ordinance committee, so I'll refer to the chairwoman. And I will refer to Mr. J. There you go. <laughs> Pass the buck tonight. Easy enough, happy to do it. Um, so as you just noted, at the request of the Ordinance Committee, uh, staff had a, a few meetings with, with um, the committee to talk about, this is really about notification for site plan applications. Site plan applications, for those who don't know, are for any non-residential commercial type uses or for multi-family uh, apartment type uh, developments required to go through planning board review process through the uh, provisions that are laid out in our site plan review ordinance. Currently, the site plan review ordinance does not have any requirement for direct for notification to abutters. Certainly, we post the agenda on the website and we have sort of a, a, an email list, um, but we know that folks you know, may not all be on all those lists or coming and looking at our bulletin board here in Town Hall. Um, so, I think the consideration from the ordinance committee was is there a way we can try to mimic some of our other ordinances, such as our subdivision ordinance, or our Board of Appeals process, which requires notification of abutters within 500 feet. Um, and so that's the proposal that's before you. We have draft language that identifies that for any site plan application that comes into our department for review by the plan board, there will be um, direct noter, uh, abutter notification, or uh, within 500 feet, I should say, uh, of the application. All right, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Oh, sorry. Oh, and second reading. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Is there any member of the public who would like to <laughs> speak on this topic? Seeing none, 
come back to, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. And a second. Discussion. I'd just like to say this is one of those things that flies under the radar and doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but I wanted to um, commend the Ordinance Committee because this is something that's going to mean a lot to somebody uh, when it happens. And mm -hmm. I think that this was a fantastic reaction to a, a couple of residents' concerns, and uh, notifying abutters when something's going to happen near them will can only do good. So I just, I know, again, this isn't much fanfare, but I think this is a great improvement, so thank you for it. All right. Uh, all those in favor? And that is unanimous as well. And that will move us on to order number 19-039, a public hearing and action on the new request for a massage license for, and I apologize if I uh, butcher the name here a little bit, but Yacellus Tui, doing business as Yacellus Tui Massage Therapy, located at 10 Plaza Drive, Suite 203. Uh, and I'll this defer to the... Mm -hmm. This is standard procedure for a first uh, applicant. Um, everything is in order. Everything, all the background checks came in. Okay. We recommend approval. Great. Is there any member of the public who wishes to speak on massage therapy? <laughs> Seeing none, we'll move to... Uh, is there a motion so to move. approve? Second. And any discussion? This huh? is where I might say, could, are there samples? <laughs> <laughs> in the uh, spirit of... Councillor Chiazza. Yeah, me too. <laughs> There's, they probably need the practice, right? Uh, so all those in favor? And that is also unanimous. Moving on to old business. Uh, we have order number 19-033, a second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 601, the Traffic Ordinance, Section 2, Higgins Beach, and Section 4-2, Pine Point Co-op. Um, this came out of the Ordinance Committee. And... Uh, Chairwoman Katarina would like to offer any context. We've um, been through it before, but yeah, th again, these just um, came about from either the police department or just some changes made at the Pine Point Co-op, um, and have been heard by ordinance. Came out of ordinance, and um, they're back before us today for the hearing. And is there any member of the public who wishes to speak on this item? Jay Green, I live at 135 Beach Road. As I said last month, when you brought this up, nobody made any comments, and I asked questions. I hope someone from the Ordinance Committee is going to have the courtesy to address how you get around taking four more commercial fishing spots and turning them into handicap. Has anybody bothered to call the DMR and ask them if they approve? I hope somebody will address that. I'm not threatening you, but I'm going to make a complaint. That, that is a covenanted area, and you continue to pinprick it until it's all going to be gone for the commercial fishermen. I hope somebody will step up the plate tonight and explain to me how you benefit commercial fishermen with four handicapped spots down there. Please, explain that. You have the time now. I get all the three minutes. You guys get all night. But I'd love to hear somebody answer that for me. Thank you. And that concludes public comment. And I uh, do have a motion to approve. So moved. Second. And discussion. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, just mention a couple of things about this. Uh, you know, there was a small language change uh, primarily around the Pine Point uh, co-op parking that uh, Mr. Green has referenced. Uh, and this, I have to admit it, I uh, was responsible for trying to shepherd this back and forth to, to committees, and uh, we even got an opinion from uh, outside counsel on this uh, around a wording change concerning uh, uh, commercial vehicles, unauthorized commercial vehicles using the, the dirt parking lot area. Uh, the issue, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to vote in favor of it, I, I know this is gonna, it's pretty far down the road, however, it does... Uh, underscore the fact that there, there are unresolved issues uh, concerning conflicting pressures, uh, competing demands on the space down uh, at the Pine Point Co-op. So I just uh, I think we're going to be revisiting this in one fashion or another as time goes by. So it's just a, a caution. But I, I look forward to us learning more about it and actually studying uh, 
the area and looking at it more closely as a council and uh, there are some suggestions for how we might do that including a site walk as well as providing the the councilors with a detailed map that actually shows uh, covenant protected areas and other areas that are, are being uh, improved as we speak in terms of lines being painted and so forth. So uh, just a cautionary note, I'm, I'm not voting in favor of it, but I understand the reasoning for why it's gotten to this point and um, uh, do, do share some similar frustrations about it. But I, I'm confident we, if we keep focus on it, we will ultimately be able to resolve these issues hopefully. Any other councilor discussion? Councilor Johnson? Is, is there uh, an articulation why there was four spots that were handicapped versus, let's say, two? Is there, is there a rationale behind the four, so to speak? And I'm asking as somebody who wasn't I, in I attendance. I missed the last meeting because yep. I was out of town, so I, I don't remember. I okay. guess yep. not remember that. There are federal requirements in terms of the uh, percentage of uh, parking handicapped spaces uh, as compared to the number of other public spaces. Yep. And I, I can't say for certain, but I, I expect that recommendation was based on that ratio. Uh, I can say for certain, though, the proposal in the next to the back row, as it's referenced, is outside of the covenant area. It's on town-owned land and therefore not subject to the restrictions of the covenant. Right. Yeah, I, I, and, and I agree with everything Tom said. The uh, one thing I may add is that, you know, there's always sort of the plan and reality, what actually happens down there. It is bound to be the case this summer. Uh, usually right around the 4th of July, but uh, where people will be parking where they're not supposed to be parking and we're going to rely on folks to help us, you know, work our way through that. Uh, there's a general issue with undesignated spaces that are covered by the, by the lease agreement yep. that we've negotiated yep. with, uh, with the, the folks who bought the co-op. So I, mean, I think everyone's well-intentioned. We want to get at the right answer here and I think we can work through it, but uh, we're going to have some bumps uh, along the, the way. Uh, uh Councilor Katarina, uh, Remind me, this went to the uh, shellfish or whatever committee. It right? did. It Coastal came, Waters. It, yep. Correct. It came to ordinance, and then we said we right. wanted to get their input. They suggested some language changes Which that involved the commercial vehicles and the unpaved dirt parking lot. Yeah. That was recommended that we strike that based upon advice from outside council, and that's what that's the did. form that it's in now. So. Yeah. And I, and I know Mr. Mazzoni was, was fine with this the way it is, too, so that's why I urge support for this tonight. So. Yeah, my recollection was that, yes, we sent it to that committee. We yeah. got no rebuttal or feedback yeah. back. Um, yeah. And then we sent it to our own council to make sure that we were in compliance with the new uh, agreement yeah. down in, at, with the co-op. Right. And that, that actually prompted some language changes. Right. Um, so... Just if I could, it's, yeah. I think it's important to think about and remember the genesis of this. This has been actually, it started at the uh, Coastal Waters uh, Committee some years back. I'm uh, rather sheepish to admit how long it's been uh, in process, if you will. Uh, but it really was designed intently to provide protections for parking purposes for commercial fishermen uh, in terms of actually designating signing spaces and having it, it ordained such that we can enforce it. I guess the other point worth making, you may recall through the budget process, we've shift staff uh, the oversight of that lot to the police department. Mm -hmm. And so we expect that will put us in the best position for enforcement purposes. Mm -hmm. That's always a challenge, but having reserve officers and the uh, Marine Patrol officer uh, working from that location, we believe puts us in the best position to actually enforce the requirements of this mm -hmm. ordinance. Yeah. Good. I, I guess I would, oh, sorry. Can I just ask yep. one more? The four handicap is that's total for that entire lot. Is that correct? When where that, is that four in addition to some that already exist, or is that is that four more? Or is that four total? I, I guess my question. There are additional ones uh, closer to the water. I, I honestly can't say how many. I, don't I know. think there are. There's two. at least two along the shorefront, as I recall. Yeah, I think there are two. I can't recall. I can't recall exactly. Okay. So we're saying there's approximately six. If Um, okay, all those in favor? All opposed? Four, <laughs> four, one. All right, and we'll move on to order number 19-040, act on the request to approve the names to the various committees and boards that were posted at the May 15th town council meeting. Would you like to? And I that? could read those if you, if you like. Sure. Uh, 
Coastal Waters and Harbor Committee, uh, Mr. Michael Slavin will move from first alternate to full voting position with term to expire in 2021. And Mr. Vincent Clow uh, as first alternate with a term to expire in 2021, replacing um, Mike Slavin. Shellfish Conservation Commission, Barney Martin is appointed as the first alternate with a term to expire in 2019. Transportation Committee, Katie Fellows is recommended for approval as appointment to the first alternate with a term to expire in 2020. And finally, for the ZBA, the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, recommendation to appoint Alton Chip Howe as first alternate with that term to expire in 2019. Thank you. Is there any member of the public would like to speak about appointments? Seeing none, uh, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. And council discussion. Seeing none. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. And move on to new business. We've got order number 19-041, a first reading, and refer to the planning board. The proposed changes to chapter 405, the town of Scarborough zoning ordinance section six definitions. Uh, and this came to us by way of the housing alliance. Mm -hmm. Yes, if I could introduce you. Please. Um, it's, a, it's a very simple change, changing uh, two words in the, in the uh, definition of affordable housing. Those two words end up being very important. Um, some of you may recall there was a series of changes that came to the council that you approved. I will admit they were a bit convoluted, and frankly, in that course of that uh, back and forth, this, got, uh, this was an oversight. This was always the intention of the uh, Housing Alliance and this particular section uh, really serves the purpose of helping the developer um, fix a sale price and market these lots. And it, it's the way of determining the household income that's, uh, that's allowable for a uh, qualified purchaser. So this change is highly recommended by the committee and uh, we look for your support. And we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Councilor discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank oh, you. did any member of the public want to say anything about that? Okay. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> uh, order number 19-042, first reading and schedule a public hearing on the request to amend chapter 1016, the garage yard sale ordinance. This also came out of the ordinance committee. And I'll let Chairwoman Katarina introduce this as well. Yes, thank you. Um, this came about because of a um, service group and town alliance club in particular uh does yard sales um to raise money so that they can stay in existence um and we we talked about this on ordinance we want to make sure that it's not abused by increasing the number of yard sales people uh can hold but we feel like you know, increasing it just makes sense, both for groups who use it for fundraising, because an awful lot of yard sales in, your, in, in uh, Scarborough um, are used for um, fundraising purposes uh, for various groups, too. So we felt this was a good, uh, a good balance. So that's where this came from. And is there any member of the public who would like to talk about yard sales today? I think they have too many down high points. <laughs> <laughs> Come on up. Come you on want, up. You've got to step up to the podium if you want to be official here. <laughs> Give us your name and address. <laughs> Michael Sawyer, 74 Sawyer. Uh, before Captain Terrace, it was 74 Sawyer Road to you. Um, you guys made me change it. Um, yeah, there's too many down high points. They, they, they seem to be every year, same houses. Doing it weekend after weekend after weekend. I thought there was a limit of two a year by a house. But these people seem to uh, do it every weekend. There it, it ought to be a stop to it. Especially down Pine Point when there's, um, the traffic is high volume. Thank you. All right, so I'll close public comment, and uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Take it. And councilor discussion. Councilor Johnson. In my perfect world, there'd be yard sales all day, every day. 
because that's what I do on my Saturday mornings. But I, uh, I, I have to agree with a member of the public. There are some standing yard sales in the Pine Point area. You are absolutely correct. And there are some standing yard sales off Broad Turn Road that are every single weekend. Uh, so I would just add that I, I, you are correct about that. And so, but I love yard sales. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Council Kettering. I would say that these continuous yard sales are probably in violation of our ordinance and for whatever reason people need to be made aware of that. So I, I would just tell the public if you're aware of someone who's do doing it. continuous the park in town of Scarborough. The police report it when they want. Yeah, well, whatever. I, what would be helpful is that if you're aware of and this is for you or anybody else in the public of someone who's continuously doing yard sales, to you can call the police, and if you don't want to call the police on someone, I hate to say call Tody Justice, our town clerk, but you could do that and uh, do find out. We have a list of uh, those who are supposed to have yard sales, yeah. and that's shared with the police department. And yeah. Everything, so. yeah. So just let us know, all right? <laughs> the other counselor. Afterwards, afterwards. Uh, yeah, no, I would just, um, I, I think a couple of what Councilor Canarina said is that um, I, I do think this is probably one of those ordinances that people, A, don't fully know or understand that there is an actual limit, uh, and B, um, that it becomes a matter of whether or not we are uh, uh, following the, our own ordinance or not. And that's a problem on a lot of different things, so I would agree with you there. Um, that said, we did, in this particular instance, make a few tweaks to accommodate the Lions Club. Um, they're not in a residential area. They're host hosting their uh, yard sales for the purposes of funding their organization. So um, with that, I will take a vote. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. And moving on to non-action items are none and we'll go to standing and special committee reports and liaison reports and we'll start down on the left because these gentlemen are going to be very quick. <laughs> Councilor Hamill. Uh, one, I, I, Peter is not here to speak for the finance committee but uh, you know wanted to thank Sean Babine again for his uh, service on that committee. It was actually you know really good working with him and uh, uh, and Peter this year. The only thing I'm going to say is that uh, come out and vote on June 11th. No, uh, that's the only thing I want to say about the Finance Committee. Uh, appointments, uh, nothing further to report there beyond uh, the uh, recommendations that were approved. Uh, and I had one quick update for, uh, for ECHO Maine. I I'm going to be joining Mike Shaw as a voting member on the uh, Executive Committee there. And uh, we are having a, uh, an annual Board of Directors meeting on uh, Thursday, June 20th. So I look forward to serving with Mike, who's really been a, a key uh, key person on that uh, on that group and uh, following in the big shoes of uh, Bill Donovan who served in that role uh, at Echo Maine. Um. Thank you. Councilor Donovan. Uh, Rules and Policies Committee met. Uh, we had three items on the agenda. We made a small change to uh, uh, Rule 208A uh, uh, to just clarify a matter that will be coming forward to the Town uh, Council uh, soon. We have been working on a TIF a credit enhancement agreement policy for quite some time, uh, and uh, that finally got scrubbed to the point where we had a unanimous support to advance that to the Finance Committee, which has a strong interest in looking at that also. So that's uh, progress. Uh, and uh, we uh, agreed upon a process for when a counselor may speak for the entire council, which essentially was to establish a resolution process so that a resolution would be presented on an agenda, uh, the content of the uh, uh, public uh, statement on behalf of the entire council would be set forth more or less in the content of the resolution. Uh, and therefore, we have a organized way of approaching that. This, I attended the Sustainability Committee meeting. Um, they uh, spent a great deal of time talking about the recycling outreach program, which is to check We've got the problem, I think everybody knows by now, of uh, too much uh, contamination in our recycling uh, bins. Uh, and we've got some uh, interns hired mm -hmm. to uh, uh, try and do a program of checking to make sure that we're in better compliance than we are. We also talked uh, about a sustain sustainability reserve account. It's a concept. 
It would be a source of funds uh, uh, for sustainability uh, projects. And they talked in terms of a funding mechanism. Uh, uh, you have building codes, and you have what's called stretch laws, where if you make a basic compliance, uh, you have a fee associated with that. But if you stretch and reach a higher level of performance uh, in terms of uh, 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 efficiencies in your building, uh, then you would be exempt from that. So that was also talked about. Those are the two committees I think I had. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Caterina. Uh, yeah, very quickly, um, very important ordinance meeting <clears throat> on Thursday, June 20th at 4 p.m. We are looking for public input on marijuana uh, rules and regulations in the town of Scarborough. We want to give direction to our town attorney who will be working over the summer on draft ordinances. So please come. It's at 4 o'clock uh, here at Town Hall. So anyone with any interest in what's going on with marijuana? Retail. It's Thursday, the 20th of June. Okay. Uh, historic preservation met the other night. We continue to work on um, listings and and looking at what houses in town may be included in a list for historic preservation for the public. We don't have like Portland does real strict rules about historic preservation. You can and can't. Um, but we certainly encourage people with any interest, if you think you live in a historic building, to re you can reach out to me if you'd like, because um, there may be some, a few benefits to you if you ever thought you wanted to go to code enforcement and get some help and uh, whatever. Um, and they are absolutely thrilled um, with the schoolhouse building, the, the money that we were able to give to um, to, for the, uh, what do I want to, the, the, thank you, I can't even talk anymore, the foundation and roof work, uh, the Marys are set to start working on that in July, so that will get done sooner rather than later, which is, which is good to know. Long range planning is meeting Friday at 8 a.m., bright and early at the Sedco building, third floor for anyone who's interested in attending that. And then uh, Maine Municipal Legislative Policy Committee, um, of course, they keep us up to date on what's going on. Things change by the minute right now because they're trying to get done in the legislature by June 19th, the statutory adjournment. We are cautiously optimistic that we will get an increase in municipal revenue sharing, so please keep your fingers crossed and let your legislators know that you'd like to see some more money returned to the town from the state. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you. Councilor Johnson. Uh, sure. The, uh, I think I, well, the communication committee, we, we canceled the meeting, I believe, last week, but from the previous meeting. Uh, just to remind people, we, we came up with a recycling survey that is available at the voting booth. Uh, it's available here in the town hall lobby right now as well. Mm -hmm. No more? No more. Where did it go? We moved the voting into the office. Oh. Is the survey going to go with it? No. Okay. No survey. No recycling survey. Uh, we had, Actually, we had probably five people that took. Okay. Well, I was one of them. I took the recycling I was survey. One of them too. I, I got a. <laughs> I got a six out of eight. So I do have some work to do because I did not go eight for eight on the recycling survey. Uh, we had a joint community. We canceled the regular schedule of the meeting simply because we had a joint communication meeting, uh, committee meeting with the BOE to discuss some budget outreach. Uh, it does look like it is more within the scope of the BOE to spend funds and to actively promote the budget. Uh, so we left it, essentially the way that meeting left is the BOE is, is taking the ball and running on most of the communications for that. Uh, as a reminder, on June 25th, we have our second round table, quarterly round table uh, sessions. And this one will be at Blue Point School, I believe, and that is at 6.30, so it's a Tuesday night. 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, that's June 25th at Blue Point School. Uh, for my liaison reports, uh, the one I have the most is really just a thank you to the Chamber of Commerce. They hosted uh, a few of us at the table here, actually all of us at the table here. Uh, at, and a thank you to Atria as well. Uh, we had a great dinner put on by the Chamber of Commerce and Atria. Um, and I got to meet some new people at my table. And overall, it was a great experience. So I just wanted to thank the Chamber of Commerce and Atria for holding uh, that event for us. 
Great, and all of my committees have been covered, so we'll move right into the town manager report. A few quick points of interest. Um, as the council's aware, we were going out to our annual bond sale. This is the time of year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, our ratings have been affirmed by both Moody's and Standard & Poor. Uh, we had very positive conversations. I would not be surprised, given the way those conversations went, that we'll moving toward a positive outlook, if not an upgrade. So uh, very good trending. Uh, those reports were sent out to you. Uh, they're a fairly quick read, uh, so I encourage you to take a look at those. Uh, I do expect uh, this will be a, a matter of discussion at the Finance Committee uh, meeting later this month. Uh, then today, we actually had bond sale and, and have awarded uh, the bonds. Uh, the uh, interest rate that we chose was 2.48%, so uh, very favorable rates. We had five bidders, so good activity there. Uh, there was sizable bid premium, and we expected that might be a possibility. Uh, it was uh, terrific <coughs> that Councillor Hayes was able to join us in that call and make some decisions. We've decided to use the premium to, to basically buy down uh, the amount we're bonding, so we're going to bond $400,000 less than Great. was authorized. Great. We're paying, <coughs> covering uh, the FY20 uh, interest costs of about $260,000 covering the full cost of issuance, and then there's actually about $40,000 in excess premium beyond that. So very pleased with that result. That's awesome. uh, in the uh, area of housekeeping, uh, on June 10, there is a stormwater MS4 permit okay. education. This is an annual requirement for elected officials. Uh, it's being held with the planning board. You've all been invited. Uh, if you can to come, we certainly would appreciate that. It's fairly painless, I promise. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's an important thing. We need to report that we've actually held this training to be able to check off uh, that requirement. I'll let councillors speak to our experience this week, uh, taking a tour of the edge, one of the edge sports facilities in Wellesley, Mass. Um, and just to foreshadow for your next meeting, uh, staff is preparing what, we'll, uh, what I think will be probably the first of multiple discussions around growth. And our intent uh, in the first instance is to really uh, better understand what where we've been and, and um, really diagnose and establish a, a baseline of facts that I think we can all work from. It does appear that we may have some property <coughs> tax uh, uh, <coughs> hardship abatement uh, matters that may need to be attended to. Uh, we have two applications and so we're processing those so those may need to be attended to on the 19th as well. Uh, and I guess uh, while I've got the floor I just wanted a uh, counselor um, Babine is not here, but I just wanted to publicly acknowledge uh, certainly a service to this town. And on a personal note, he's been a, a, a very good, uh, certainly very supportive of staff, uh, a great collaborator, uh, and one that will continue uh, in his way of public service, I think, uh, in Augusta. So we hope to have him back at a public meeting. We do have a bit of a parting gift for him, and perhaps he can give us some good news in the budget when he comes. <laughs> Thank you. All right, we'll move right on to council member comments and we'll start at this end of the table for Mr. Johnson. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just pick up where uh, Tom alluded on um, Monday of this week. Uh, Councillor Donovan, myself, and Mr. Hall went down to Wellesley, Massachusetts to essentially scope out the Edge Sports Complex that is about a month to two months away from opening its doors. Mm -hmm. Uh, the reason for that is that there is a possibility that the sports complex would be looking to um, secure some space in the downs and uh, it's an opportunity. It's to explore for us to explore the possibility of you know how could the town be involved could the town uh, is that possibly the uh, solution to our community center question uh, nothing by any stretch of the imagination has been re realistically discussed but it was a great great to get down there to see the facility uh, it is massive it's a hundred and forty thousand square Ooh. feet uh, so it, it's quite impressive uh, it was very uh, educational, and the two gentlemen, uh, was it Sean and Chris or? Ryan and Chris. Ryan, Ryan and Chris. Uh, the two gentlemen that head up the project uh, appeared to be great partners if we did work with them. They're incredibly straightforward, and I found them to be uh, candid and honest, and I think that they'd be easy to work with. Uh, but again, with all that said, we're just in the fact-finding mm -hmm. phase and just to see if it's something that is worth exploring further. So, And that's all I have. Thanks. Councillor Caterina. Yeah, um, I think people in town have forgotten that there's an election on Tuesday. Uh, the turnout has been abysmal, um, to say the least. I find it most disappointing as someone who was an election 
worker for a long, long time, and I, I think I don't think I've ever missed an election in my life. I'm one of those. Um, but that being said, um, please turn out Tuesday. Absentee balloting's done, so you can't come in to. Oh, I apologize. I thought it was all done. Tomorrow's the last day, so get in here tomorrow. Otherwise, it's going to be Tuesday uh, to to come in and vote. Uh, the school budget's on the ballot. Uh, there's a Sebago Alliance um, issue that we, I'd love to see people vote yes on because it means an extra $83,000 uh, for the schools plus help them to do cooperative buying, which is always a better way to buy. Um, we also have uh, two wonderful people running for one town council seat. I wish we had two seats for them, but... Um, there's only one seat this time around. Um, and there's a question on there, too, about whether you want to continue having the school budget go out to vote. And that's required by state law. Every three years, we have to ask that. So if you don't vote, I don't want to hear you complaining. But you'd best get out and vote, because that, to me, is your duty um, as, as a citizen. So that's my speech for tonight. Thank you. We'll move on to Councilor Donovan. Yeah, as uh, Councilor Johnson was saying, uh, we created something of an ad hoc committee, Councilors Foley, Johnson, and, uh, and I all expressed interest in the uh, Edge Sports uh, proposal. Uh, they have uh, had a fair amount of contact with the Scarborough Downs people. Uh, and because of the, uh, the interest in the community for a community center, uh, for a long time, uh, and the size of this private uh, undertaking, uh, we are really trying to dig in and do uh, some uh, educating of ourselves on this. The trip to Wellesley to see this facility, it is eye-opening. Uh, it is two hockey rinks, uh, a uh, Olympic-sized swimming pool, and a ball field all under cover. Uh, and then associated physical therapy, community space. It's really quite impressive. Now, I'm not sure that that's what's going to be planned for the Scarborough Downs area, but uh, these people do have the ability. They've got a dozen projects or more done. They've done it, and, uh, uh, and they seem to be able to have the ability to put forward a lot of what the community would say was high on our list. It was very good to travel down with Todd Souza and <coughs> town manager Tom Hall because they really gave an important perspective that Paul and I shared pretty strongly. Uh, we just didn't articulate it the way they did, that a community center is there to serve the community, not necessarily the entire region. These people have to rent space. So they've got a business motive to look beyond the four corners of Scarborough. But we, as the community of Scarborough, have a strong interest in looking out for our citizens. And so that was uh, seniors were very high on the list. And I think that seniors will appreciate that because uh, Mr. Souza seems to be very focused on making sure that whatever comes of this proposal that uh, that we look long range in terms of meeting the needs of those in the community who, uh, who would really benefit from it. So it's, there's nothing like it in the greater Portland area. We, I think we certainly could conclude that. That was quite remarkable. Thank you. Councilor Hamill. Uh, yeah, I, I just uh, wanted to uh, uh, thank uh, Tom and the, the, the town staff for their uh, good work uh, through the budget process. And, uh, you know, I think we're in a much better place. Uh, we're not done yet. We've got to get turn out the vote. But hopefully, uh, you know, the quiet is not necessarily a bad thing, you know, that uh, we don't you know, really seem to have had a all-in better dialogue this year. And hopefully that will lead to a better outcome and, a, and a, uh, hopefully a view of uh, how we might deal with similar challenging issues together as a town. So I'm, in, I'm really encouraged by that. Uh, at the same time, I'm looking forward to a, maybe a little bit slower schedule over the summer. So, uh, in spite of all the data requests, uh, and finally, I'm really pleased to know that uh, 
we're, that uh, Councillor Johnson and I will not be dispatched to Bethel to take the stormwater training <laughs> like we did for uh, our, our Councillor. He'll training. be Presque Isle. He'll set us up to Presque Isle. <laughs> so. Bethel. <laughs> Oh, you guys had fun. It was fun. It was good fun. All set? Uh, all right. Well, I am so, so shocked and thrilled and privileged that I'm the only one that's going to get to say this. But tonight and this weekend is uh, hugely monumental for our seniors. And uh, this past week, I had the privilege of going to Michigan and watching my niece and nephew graduate from high school. And as our seniors here in Scarborough are graduating this week, um, just want to, you know, remind them that truly the, it's an exciting time in a young person's life, um, and, and the world really is there for your taking. Um, so make good choices and enjoy celebrating with your family and friends, and, but most importantly, stay safe uh, through the celebrations. So um, congratulations to all the Scarborough seniors. Um, also, uh, again, it's been said, but can't be said enough. Um, you've got to get out and vote. Uh, that is your voice, and it's your chance to weigh in. Um, I do think, um, you know, I'm, I'm with Councillor Hamlin hoping and, and thinking that the quiet is a, is a positive thing. Um, and, uh, but I also know that a low voter turnout, no matter which way uh, the election comes out, people will point fingers at that and say, well, that's because nobody came out to vote. So let's have high numbers regardless so that we can all feel good about that process. Um, that's important. And then last but not least, um, uh, I know tonight was to be Councillor Babine's last meeting with us. And uh, although he and I often don't agree on a lot of things, I do have a huge amount of respect for anyone who chooses to step up and serve. It is um, hugely time consuming and uh, nobody does it for the fame and fortune. I can promise you that. <laughs> Um, and he has served for, I, had, I mean, he has told us many times, 13, 14 years, yeah, something like that with discontinuous terms. That's a really long time to uh, serve your town. So he certainly deserves uh, our respect and gratitude for that. So with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Jacob. All those in favor. And Toadie wins the night. Thank you.